So today's discussion is an overview of um, reproductive health, especially women's health, reproductive health concerns, STIs, contraceptives, um, abortions, infertility, and a lot of those different topics that we talk about related to reproductive health. So first off is assessment. And if you look at different assessment findings that we look at in a woman, for the most part, it's no different than any other health assessment you're going to do. So I'm not going through that because hopefully by this point in, in your program, you know how to do an, an overall assessment. Really the biggest difference in a women's reproductive health assessment is related to the reproductive system. So that physical assessment, the, the um, pelvic examination, for instance, asking questions about past medical history related to those, um, asking questions about previous use of contraceptives, previous birth history, things like that. Um, so, so it's a little bit extra, um, but there's nothing that's really changed. One thing that's important um, when we're talking about this type of assessment is modesty. Um, for those of us that have babies, you know, modesty is one of those things that kind of goes out the window when you have a baby. Um, but it is important to to provide that as, as much as you can because it is a very sen oftentimes sensitive subjects. Um, and then to add to their discomfort, putting them in a situation um, of decreased modesty can, it can make it difficult and can actually decrease your ability to get the information you need from the patient because if they're not comfortable, they're not going to give you the full history like you need. So modesty is important always, um, but especially in these sensitive kinds of situations. So when we're talking about genitalia, here's a picture of external genitalia, and here's a picture of internal genitalia. Hopefully by now you've had anatomy and physiology enough that you know what these pieces and parts are and an overview of what they do. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, if you do not know, especially the internal female reproductive organs, if you do not know their functions, um, I highly recommend you review those back from your anatomy and physiology um, because you do need to know what those internal structures do. So a little bit about menstruation. So menarche is the onset of menstruation, um, that first period. Um, typically preteen time, it varies from woman to woman. Um, usually menarche is actually at the end of puberty. Oftentimes we think it's the onset of puberty, but actually it is at the end of puberty. Um, usually other signs of puberty, such as breast development, for example, happen long before um, that menarche happens. So this chart you see right here, I do not want you to memorize. It is not where I want you to know specifically how things happen. But as we talk about the hormonal changes, temperature changes, like when we talk about the family planning rhythm method and all, um, it's good to see how all these things interact together. You see how, um, for instance, your estrogen, which is a stradiol, um, as it, it increases to, to really... Um, encourage that follicle to open and release an egg um, and then when it does it drops and then progesterone increases and the reason progesterone is important we'll talk about this when we get to to pregnancy progesterone is considered the hormone of pregnancy so if you think of a fertilized egg as like a foreign body your body just sees something is now there that wasn't there before it doesn't recognize it as self so your uterus naturally is going to try and push out this now foreign body progesterone calms all that down um, so that um, you can hopefully allow implantation of that fertilized egg um, as you see progesterone increases because it's trying to protect that environment and then if that fertilization doesn't happen or that attachment doesn't happen it drops back down and you see it it goes it coincides with the bottom picture the the building up of the lining of the uterus it increases increases as progesterone increases and then sloughs off so I don't want you to memorize this picture whatsoever um, but it's good to see how the different parts of our body interact together and explains where you see some of those things that happen so when we're talking about identifying the first day of, a, of your menstrual cycle, and again, this will also be important when we get to um, pregnancy, because when we talk about estimating delivery dates, um, we talk about the first day of the menstrual cycle. Um, so when we 
when we're talking about menstrual cycles, it's considered to start on the first day a woman has her period. Um, so typically, menstrual cycles are anywhere from 26 to 32 days. It varies from woman to woman, um, but it's about once a month. And the first day of that cycle is when they when they have their period. And then um, they have their period and 14 days before their period is when they ovulate. So, and we'll talk about when we get to family planning, why that's important. You can't focus um, forward. It's not 14 days afterwards. It's 14 days before you have your period. So, um, when you're talking about family planning, it's important to, to have if or for a woman to have those regular periods in order for that type of method to work. Um, so when we're talking about the other end of the cycle, climacteric and menopause, this is the decline of those reproductive years. So climacteric, often, oftentimes people will hear this called um, your premenopausal stage. Um, this can last sometimes 10 years. Um, oftentimes during this period of time, um, your periods are very erratic. Um, you, a woman may go four or five months without a period, then all of a sudden have a period that seems to last an entire month or six weeks. Um, so lots of irregularity as those hormones are, are declining. Um, the important thing about climacteric, though, is that women oftentimes when they go several months without having a period, they may think, oh, I'm okay, I don't need birth control. And there's a lot of oopsies that happen during the climacteric period because of that um, potential in reproductive decline. Women often think if they're not having regular periods, then they can't get pregnant, which is very untrue. Um, lots of later in life babies that were surprises can occur during this time. So it's important to teach women during this time that there is a still potential of pregnancy. Even if they haven't had a period in six months, they can still get pregnant. Sometimes women, especially in this time, may still be ovulating even if they're not having a period. So when it is determined that they have reached the end of their reproductive life is called menopause. So to define menopause, there has to be 12 consecutive months of zero period. So if a woman goes nine months without periods and then all of a sudden has one, will that 12 month cycle starts over again? It has to be 12 consecutive full months of no periods to determine that um, there are um, at the end of their reproductive um, period. So there are various things that are associated with menopause as well as the climacteric period. There are, are symptoms associated with it that women often feel such as what we call vasomotor symptoms. Most of the time you've probably heard them called hot flashes. Um, this is usually one of the most uncomfortable things that women experience. And it's also oftentimes the what they use to determine hormone replacement therapy, it, whether it's used or not. Um, they often have very drying of the skin um, and mucous membranes as well. So not only dry skin, but dry vaginal tissue and things like that. So um, during this time, intercourse may become painful um, because of the dryness. Um, they often have breast tissue atrophy, um, changes in libido, all those things can happen um, related to those changes in those hormones. Um, so teaching them about not only symptoms, but also how to take care of themselves. So when we're talking about health maintenance and symptom management, so things like exercise, increasing calcium, mag, and high fiber. The reason the calcium, mag, and high fiber are important is for your cardioprotective benefits. Um, in med surge, you probably talked about when you talked about cardiac, how estrogen has a cardioprotective benefit. Women that are prior to menopause have a much decreased risk of having a heart attack than men do. Um, once women reach menopause um, and they have that rapid decline in estrogen levels, um, their their risk of heart attack is the same as a man. So um, that is why the, once they hit that menopause age, they are high risk for cardiac 
um, problems, but the calcium, mag, and high fiber is related to bone health. So your bones are already starting to depreciate in your 20s, your late 20s. However, once menopause happens and estrogen goes away, um, that it rapidly decreases more. So even patients that don't have osteoporosis, they're going to have um, decreased bone density if they're not taking some kind of supplementation or an adequate diet to maintain those minerals. So one thing that came out about 20 years ago or so, 25 years ago, um, is hormone replacement therapy or HRT. Um, when this first came out, they automatically put every woman on this medication um, to help with symptoms and to, to help prevent those menopausal complications or so they thought. Um, they found, though, that exogenous, and a hormone replacement therapy is essentially estrogen. What they found, though, what they thought was going to happen is giving that exogenous estrogen was going to help decrease that risk of heart attack, just like a premenopausal woman. It does not. Exogenous estrogen does not improve um, your outcomes or decrease your risk of having a heart attack like endogenous or, or hormones that are made within your body. So... The other problem with hormone replacement therapy as well is it also increased the risk of breast cancer. So it didn't seem to show any benefits medically, but it did show so, some negative effects. So hormone replacement therapy is not used on everybody. It's used based on symptom management. And mainly the symptom you look at is the severity of those vasomotor symptoms or those hot flashes. So patients that have severe vasomotor symptoms, they will use um, hormone replacement therapy and to help manage those symptoms. So another thing we'll touch on is breast health. We're really not going to go into too much detail about breast health here. We talk about it quite a bit when we talk about newborns and postpartum, um, but general breast health, we don't really focus on too much. So the main purpose of breasts is, of course, for milk production after birth, um, and there are various um, different structures that help create that. You've got your 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 lobules, which actually help create the milk, and then the ducts that carry it. So um, all those things work together to to feed that newborn. Um, there's several benign breast conditions. A large amount of times, when women feel either a lump or they feel pain or whatever it is, it's actually a benign breast condition. Breast pain is is actually very common um, and very rarely an indicator of anything malignant. In fact, when we're talking about breast cancer, we're going to talk about in a minute, um, it is not considered one of the main symptoms. Um, and actually, sometimes breast pain can be a good sign that it's not malignant. Typically, early on, breast cancer is not painful. Um, so some other breast pain it can happen just from hormonal changes, whether it be pregnancy or some people get cyclic breast pain with their cycles and things like that. Um, you have all kinds of like fibrocystic breast diseases where they get cysts in their breasts. Some women have more dense tissue or it'll feel like lumps. Um, but oftentimes it is something benign. Um, but if it's not um, and we have a malignant condition, there are symptoms that they look for. So most of the times when people think of malignant um, breast conditions, um, they think of a lump, um, which that absolutely can be one of them. Um, but it's not always. A lot of times people think, if I don't feel a lump, I don't have cancer, and that's not true. Some of the other symptoms you may see, you could have an inverted or a pulled-in nipple or even dimpling on the skin. If you look at the picture on the bottom, um, this is a condition called pude lorange. And the reason it's called that is because it looks just like an orange peel. You see how it's dimpling in at all the pore areas. Um, that can be a sign. Those skin changes can be a sign of breast cancer as well. Um, you can have leaking of the nipples. There could be just a reddened area. Um, various different things that can indicate breast cancer, not just a lump um, and teaching women not only to be doing those breast exams every month, um, but also to be looking for other abnormal symptoms, especially if it's a change, um, it, it should be investigated. It's better to investigate it and it be nothing than, than let it go. 
So when we're talking about breast assessment, um, teaching women how to do breast self-exams is the best way to prevent. Um, breast self-exams will often catch um, breast cancers at earlier stages where they are more easily treatable. Um, so it doesn't really matter. The reason I have this picture is it doesn't really matter which way um, you teach women how to do a breast exam as long as they cover all of the tissue and as long as they do it similar every month. Typically, they recommend in two positions, laying and standing. Oftentimes, it's recommended to do in the shower as well, just because of the lubrication from the water can help with feeling for any lumps um, that may be there. Um, but the, the up and down circular wedge are all methods that people um, use as long as they're using the same method. Another important thing we want to teach patients is it's not just what we think of a breast tissue all the way up into the axilla is still breast tissue. So teaching them to, to feel around in their axillary areas as well um, for, for any abnormalities that may come. The best time to do a breast self-exam is approximately one week after their period finishes. And the reason for this is because the, the breast tissue is less dense and less bumpy at that point. Um, so it's easier to feel for abnormalities. There's also for women that get breast tenderness surrounding their periods. Typically that tenderness has gone away by then. Um, so, so that will be decreased as well and they won't have to worry about that. So if they do have breast cancer, again, we're not going to go into the details, um, so you don't need to focus on this this much too much. Um, there's different types of mastectomies everywhere from where they only do a lumpectomy and remove the lump all the way to what's called a radical mastectomy, where they remove not only all the breast tissue, but the surrounding lymph nodes as well. And those are the patients that you see in the hospital. Oftentimes, they'll have a, a neon pink armband on whichever side they've had their breast um, removal. Um, and these are the patients you do not want to do a blood pressure or a blood draw on those sides where you see um, a, a pink armband or sometimes they'll have a, a sign above the bed as well. Um, but patients that have had breast cancer, you don't want to do anything that's going to um, decrease the return of fluid because the reason is like when you do a blood pressure, you squeeze that arm, um, it's going to be harder for them to return that fluid back up into their body when you do that on that side because of those lack of lymph nodes on that side. So last thing is a little bit about violence against women. Um, so violence occurs in all relationships um, and it, it occurs across all socioeconomic cultures. It is nobody is immune to this. Um, we are seeing it more and more and I think it's just more people, it's being recognized more. It used to be um, kind of, and we'll talk about this in pediatrics when we talk about suicide. Oftentimes our screenings are getting better about screening everybody for some of these things, not just people that are in, um, that look the part or, or seem like they're there for something like that. So usually like when I go to my family provider every single year for my, my um, annual physical, they ask me, or do you feel safe at home? They also ask me, do you have any thoughts of hurting yourself? Things like that, that they're routine questions are now asking everybody. Um, so hopefully it will help us recognize those, especially in women who may be too scared to speak up. So oftentimes the cycle of violence is that there is an incident, I'm sorry, they get flower, you know, whatever it be, um, the woman justify I say women it can happen with men as well justifies the situation tension begins to build up it happens again typically the situations get worse every time until until it builds up it's like when you put oftentimes when people think how can women be or even men um, be in those relationships where they allow somebody to hurt them if you think about like a frog in boiling water. Some of you may have heard this reference. If you put a frog into boiling water, it's going to jump right back out. If you put a frog in room temperature water and you gradually allow the temperature to increase, it's going to boil itself to death because it gets used to that that little bit of change. Um, so in this case, this is a lot of times what happens with these women. They start out where it's a little bit, and it's just a little bit at a time until um, it becomes so overwhelming. Oftentimes, these women are not just physically abused, but they are financially abused. They are controlled in everything they spend. 
everywhere they go. Um, so it makes it very difficult to get away from these situations. Um, so not only assessing these patients, but also trying to get them out of those situations. You can't force an adult woman or any adult um, to get out of that situation, um, but you can, your job is certainly to educate them and provide them with resources that you can. There are lots of battered women's shelters in the area um, that you can point them to. So another type of violence is human trafficking. Um, most people don't realize this, but Richmond is one of the capitals of human trafficking in the United States. And the reason for this is, um, Rich, I say Richmond and Henrico as well, Henrico. Um, and the reason is because of the, the intersecting interstates. Um, we have 64 and we have 95, two major interstates that come together right in that area. And we're only a couple hours from DC. Um, so with our location alone, it's very easy for people to get um, either children or adults or whoever it is that they have abducted um, out of the area quickly without being seen or known. So human trafficking is where you basically, it's it's essentially a slavery type of situation um, for either sexual related purposes or otherwise. Um, so recognizing these patients is important um, when we get them in our ERs. So next we're going to talk about some reproductive system disorders. 